earlier in the program tonight, I mentioned we'd be having a chat with Professor Gabriel Skelly, who is president of the epidemiology and the public health section of the Royal Society of Medicine. And uh, it's wonderful to have Gabriel on the program. Uh, you see him in programs all over the world these days. But I'm going to show you a photograph uh, from a way back. I wonder, do you remember this, Gabriel? God, I do. <laughs> well, oh, that's Arthur it's, Street. Uh, that's is Arthur it? Street. Uh, it is Arthur indeed. Street in Uri. Arthur Street in Uri, uh, the, the Arthur Street Philosophical, Philosophical Society. The West Arthur Street Philosophical Society. The West Arthur Street <laughs> Philosophical Society. <laughs> uh, and you see, your hair is a bit longer then oh. than it is now, and mine is longer now than it was then because I can't get a barber. Uh, uh, I was a very scruffy looking junior doctor at those days, yeah. Well, you, you were uh, doing all sorts of interesting things as well. You're very interested in, uh, well, everything. You just arrived back from a world uh, event. It was the World Youth Festival. Ah, the World Festival of Youth and Students, yeah, in Havana. It was That's a great right. experience, great experience. And uh, you, you were in Daisy Hill at the time. And, uh, I was. I would like maybe to to revisit that time and it seems a long way or maybe not from the, the West Arthur Street Philosophical Society in Uri and the the president of uh, the Epidemiology Society where you are today. Uh, where were you since? Because it didn't see too much of you. Mm. I, well, I, not half enough, uh, uh, did you see of me? Uh, so after I'd done a couple of years in Europe. I had a great time in Daisy Hill. It was a lovely hospital to work in and very friendly and, and great characters uh, in it. Uh, Celsus McRae and Jimmy Blundell, you know, great consultants I worked with and uh, a lovely group of uh, other junior doctors to work with as well. And then uh, someone had told me I should get in touch with these SANS people and I'd, I'd seen the group, of course. And, uh, and then I uh, was told if I went and knocked on this door, it would be, uh, it, that would be where you would be found. So I did, I didn't find you at all. I found a French woman answering the door. And uh, that was the start of it all. Uh, but after, I did two years in Daisy Hill, and then I decided, I always wanted to go into public health. Uh, I was always interested in, in the big picture of, of helping to prove the health of lots and lots of people, much as I liked uh, dealing with patients and helping patients. Uh, I always always interested in the big thing. So I wanted to do public health, but before I could do that, I had to get some more clinical experience under my belt, quite rightly. So I, I did a general practice training year and uh, I, a, a very interesting time. I did six months in, in Malaban and uh, Malaban was fantastic with Dr. Tony Smith in Malaban. And I knew him because he'd worked in the hospital uh, as a, a, a pediatric doctor. And he took me on as a trainee for six months. And I had a, a great time there. And when I was on call down there, I used to stay with uh, Jerry and Rita O'Hanlon. And I, I, I really, really liked the place. It had its, it had its moments uh, in, the, in, in the troubles. I, I had a little blue MG midget, Tom, if you remember that car. And I used to speed <laughs> round the roads, speed round the roads of South Armagh on it, back and forth across the border. And the, which I enjoyed enormously. The only scary bit was coming around a corner fast and finding a foot patrol in the middle of the road in front of you. And the brakes weren't that good. And I, I you know, screeching to a halt 20 or 30 yards past them and they weren't a bit pleased. But I, I had a great six months there. And then a, a much more sedate six months in Warren Point and Restrever. And uh, by that time I was living in Brick Row and Restrever. And uh, so I did six months in uh, the health centre in Warren Point, which again was great. And then I went off to London to study for a Gabriel, year doing public health. Before you, before you go there, I, I just remember, I, of course, Mullaban, on a misty morning early, as my oh. wandering steps to lead me, down by a farmer's station is meadow and green lawn. I heard great lamentation that the wee ones they were making, saying we'll have no more engagements with the boys of Malabang. Lovely song, isn't you know, it? Gabriel, it's a beautiful song. And I remember that blue car of yours. I was doing a radio program in Belfast, in downtown radio in Belfast, and my own car was broken. 
and I borrowed your car. Uh, and it was it was beautiful to, to be driving it. But I, after a while, I it was I think it did a soft roof on it as well. It did a, soft top, yeah, yeah. But I was a little bit worried. I maybe it's a Catholic thing to be guilty of everything. But I was worried. Am I insured to drive this car or not? Yeah. And doctor's car was written uh, uh, somewhere on it, you know, and I was stopped. There, there was a whole uh, traffic jam and uh, it is dark. And this policeman walked up to me and uh, he said, uh, you're the very man we need. Doctor's <laughs> car was written. And I said, my God, if I say I'm not a doctor, he might say, where's your insurance? As it turned out, I was insured, but I didn't know it at the time. So I got out, he was already gone, so I went and followed him. And there was this poor woman who had, she bumped her nose. It wasn't bad at all, you know, but uh, she was bleeding from her nose. And she she took a look at me, she said, doctor, I'm not too sure what to do, because the, nose, the blood's coming out of her nose and she's putting it in her hand, and then she's putting it in the other hand, thinking maybe it might be useful for again. <laughs> but eventually, I, I said, you know, I went to school and I learned about geography and where Timbuktu was, but I never learned much about the human body or what you do with a bleeding nose. But someone had told me that if you uh, pinch your nose and hold back your head, it's a good idea. So I told her that. So anyway, the policeman came back and he says, all well. I said, all well. And he says, thank you, doctor. I says, thank you, sergeant. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Gabriel, go ahead. I, I, I oh, the car. I no, do, just to divert on the car again, actually, the one time I remember the car, uh, Hamish Imlach was over staying, and he was doing a gig in Mark's bar in Dundalk, and he had no way of getting there. And I said, well, I'll come down with you, Hamish, and uh, I'll take you down. And uh, of course, I hadn't quite got the the calculations right because Hamish was not a small man this large Scottish uh, folk singer and getting him into my wee MG midget a little tiny sports car and his guitar and to and from Mark's bar and dock was and the car was bravely overloaded with him just going back a little bit uh, to uh, Hamish Imlech that you mentioned uh, yeah. who was a big influence on Billy Connolly by the way but Hamish was fond of a, a drink he was we very euphemistically put. But I remember one morning he was staying with us and he was shaking the next morning. And I said, Hamish, you're shaking. He says, it's the only exercise I get. <laughs> I remember seeing him in, in your house with uh, with that particular uh, attribution, you know, in the, uh, but I, actually I, he was a, a masterful, a craftsman, just a fantastic. I, I, yeah. On that gig when we were in Dundalk, you know, Hamish was up on stage singing in, in Mark's bar in Dundalk and it was a great crowd in. And he stopped halfway, stopped dead halfway through a song and he launched off into a great story. And what happened was he'd broken a string on his guitar and he just <laughs> stopped the song. and. While he was telling this great story, you know, took the old string off, fished one out of his bag, put the new string on, tuned it up, and finished the story, and off back into the song just where he uh, just where he left off. A consummate performer, just fantastic. Yes. But uh, after yes. I finished all that, I went off to London to study for a year. I got onto a public health training scheme, and I went to London for a year, and I had a great time in London and. Uh, I, I learned so much, I met so many wonderful people in this fantastic International School of Public Health where I was studying. And uh, I met a lot of people in London and went to a lot of music, I used to go and see Peggy Seeker and Ewan McCall and, and, and all sorts of people and, the, and uh, great music, the 100 Club in uh, Oxford Street. And oh, it was just fantastic. And uh, so then I came back and I was working at that time in Ballymena and I was living at home in Belfast and getting down to Restrever just at weekends. And uh, then uh, I'd met someone in London that I, I, I uh, kind of took a notion of, and we ended up getting married, and Rona came and lived in Belfast, and we worked there very happily for a long time. And I just kind of made my way up the ranks. So I was director of public health for the Eastern Board in, in, in those days, and I was there for five years as director of public health, and all sorts of interesting things 
there setting up young people's sexual health services, which got me into trouble, of course, with those people who thought young people shouldn't be having sex and I was only encouraging them and all that stuff. And uh, then I got asked to go to London or to England uh, to a big job, or a very big job, a regional job. And uh, I thought, yep. And at that time, actually, Tom, I was kind of in dismay about the troubles that seemed to me to have been going on half my life or more than half my life and there was no sign of it ending and uh, getting the offer to, to play play premier league really in the public health world and uh, so i went off to england so i've been in england now since 1993 and i'm still here still i live in bristol and uh i've had a, i've had a great great career well gabriel you, you met up with uh, you McCall and Peggy Seeger in London, and, and indeed, just a, a year ago or so, you may, uh, you presented the, the Creative Arts Award to Peggy Seeger, and it was wonderful to, to oh, see the two of you together, Gabriel. But you also see the value in in song and uh, and in the uh, song tradition, and you being a great advocate of public health uh, here, and. Uh, in the UK and so on, uh, mm. you actually, I believe you wrote a song about the public health system. I'd love to hear it. I'd love oh. to hear it if you wouldn't mind giving it to us. It's about, uh, it's about public health and, and the people in the history of public health who've really done so much to improve public health and the heroes, people like, that, that people will have heard of, Edward Jenner, the man who really produced a smallpox vaccination in an effective way. And uh, some you mightn't have heard of, John Snow, who found the cause of, uh, of, of, of cholera and, uh, and the uh, spread by water in London, and a uh, very important man. Uh, and Edwin Chadwick, uh, a great uh, reformer, a lawyer in the Poor Law Commission in England, set the basis for the whole development of the public health system. And a, a woman, you know, that isn't uh, honoured enough in the north of Ireland, a woman called Kitty Wilkinson from Derry, who went to, went to Liverpool and had a tragic arrival in Liverpool. Uh, the ship uh, uh, foundered and some of her family were drowned, but uh, she lived in Liverpool and, and uh, married, uh, married again. And uh, when cholera came to Liverpool, she, uh, her own kind of instincts, community instincts, she set up a, a, a big cauldron in the backyard of her house and set it up as a washroom, really, for the, the neighborhood. And cholera is a terrible disease, but it really does, doesn't do anything for the bed linen. And uh, they, they would bring uh, bed linen from the community there and boil it up in, in her cauldron and, and have it dried and so on, so that they, they'd clean linen to try and, and stop the plague. And uh, a very famous woman in her time, and there's a, a window to her in the Anglican Cathedral in, in Liverpool. Anyway, ah, I could go on about these heroes forever. Anyway, so I decided. I'd sing it a uh, song, and I thought it was, a, a, and I sort of put it a bit like a calling on song, uh, where you're introducing characters to the audience. So it goes uh, something like this: Come, all of you men and you women who work for the welfare of all, come and listen to this song while I tell you of how we must answer the call. We have all come from far distant places and traveled by road and by rail. We have come to learn from each other that hygiene and health might prevail. Edward Jenner, he did walk among us. He studied both cuckoo and pox. Sarah Nelms helped him defeat the virus. Though many his efforts did mock John Snow, he was a great hero. His deeds they are famed and renowned. But without the poor widow of Hampstead, sure the truth it would never be known. Kitty Wilkinson, she came from Ireland, and Liverpool cholera did meet. And her wash house, it shone like a beacon, helped the people the peril defeat. Edwin Chadwick, he was but a lawyer, he knew not of physic or blade, but his work 
it lay the foundations on which all of our progress is made. So never forget where we came from and the heroes we honor today and the poor people who stood right beside them. Together they showed us the way that health is the real wealth of nations. That's a truth that none can deny. So let all of our people be healthy and let poverty perish and die. There you are, Tom. Beautiful, beautiful, Gabriel. Beautiful. Is that your own song? It is, yeah, yeah. And unusually, yeah. I actually wrote it, wrote it all up and published it in a medical journal. It's the only one that's been... I, I, I suspect it's the only contemporary song that's appeared in a, a proper medical medical journal. And a couple of people do perform it at public health gatherings and meetings and things like that. So that's, that's nice. I think the it's history wonderful. of these things is so important. We need to know about... Our, if you don't know about your history, you're doomed to repeat your mistakes. And never more true is that than at this moment in time with this awful uh, virus plaguing us. Well, well, Gabriel, uh, leading on from the, the, the uh, you, as I say, you have been and always uh, and still are a great uh, advocate of the, the public health system. Uh, what shape was it in to face a, a pandemic uh, when that came along? Well, it depends where you're talking about, Tom, uh, interestingly enough, because uh, there was the emergence of an earlier coronavirus called SARS, and you'll remember SARS, and it, it, it shot around the world and killed quite a lot of people. It was a very, very nasty virus. But it wasn't quite as easily transmitted as, uh, uh, as this one. And uh, the places where it originated in the Far East and the countries who were affected took that very seriously, and they set about uh, putting in place very good arrangements uh, what to do about uh, the emergence of another novel virus or uh, bacteria or whatever sort of thing comes at us. And uh, some of those countries have been extraordinarily well prepared, snapped into action and uh, have saved thousands and thousands of lives in, in, in their countries. On the other hand, here, we haven't done as well, as you, as you know, the UK uh, is topping the, the list for the number of deaths in Europe and uh, likely to be along, uh, you know, well, it, 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 could, it could actually be the country with the biggest number of deaths per head of population in the world by the time this is finished. Um, and we weren't in good shape for a whole string of reasons, uh, largely to do with austerity and the way in which austerity was imposed and, and the, the, the restrictions on, on spending on health and preparations on health. Uh, reorganizations, I couldn't tell you the number of health service reorganizations in England I went through and at each, each, each was a step backwards and you had to pick yourself up, dust yourself down and get the whole system running again. And uh, there was a, a really a terrible lack of preparation for uh, such a pandemic as this in terms of the plans and, and the, as we know, the stocks of personal protective equipment. And I think most worryingly is the way in which the public health function has kind of withered away over the last 10 years. I, I, I resigned very publicly from my, my very senior post in the Department of Health uh, in 2012 because I was so unhappy with the way things were going and I wasn't prepared to spend any more time being paid a very generous salary uh, for dismantling everything I'd spent the rest of my working life to put together. And so it has proven to be that the public health system hasn't been fit for purpose. And I, I think our politicians have made bad decisions and they haven't had the right advice along the way. And, and uh, uh, clearly the preparations weren't in place and we're paying the price for that. And we're gonna go on paying the price for that until this uh, until this this particular pandemic is over gabriel you mentioned uh, in your song uh, about some of the heroes and, and the uh, i suppose the etymology of the word hero comes from the greek meaning protector and i i think we put so much emphasis on defense defending the nation and so on but people 
are persuaded that that means getting a gun and running a thousand mile away to defend <laughs> your own place. Whereas actually the defense of people's health is so important. It is indeed. I, I, fun, just to go back to the hero business, I'm not a great fan of hero history and heroes. There's a great line in one of Bertolt Brecht's plays, Life of Galileo, unhappy the land that needs heroes. And I think that's very, very true, which is why I talk about the plain people uh, in that song as, as well, who, who really made the difference. And uh, yeah, we, we, we haven't invested, you know, and uh, there has been a public health crisis going on in Northern Ireland and in uh, Britain for some time now. And it's manifest by the fact that our life expectancy has stopped improving. Now, this is the first time this has happened in um, over 100 years outside wartime, uh, that life expectancy has stopped proving. We've all, our health's always got better because we always made collective efforts to make it better and our, our lives better and our living conditions better, our environment uh, better in so many ways over the last century or so. Uh, but we've stopped doing that. And as a result, our life expectancy, not only has it stopped getting better, but for some people, uh, particularly women and particularly those in the less well-off parts of, uh, of the UK, uh, their life expectancy has actually been dropping in this last number of years. And, I, I, and to go from that situation of a really big, you know, it's not a headline grabbing public health crisis, but for me, it says everything about the state of the country and the state of the, the body politic and, and, and the state of our feeling about looking after people and, and that collectivity. To go, to go into a pandemic as such a serious thing in a we already weakened state, both organizationally and in terms of the health of the population, it's, uh, it, it could hardly be worse. That's one of the, the problems people keep talking, uh, you know, the politicians keep talking about being led by the science, you know, we're following the science. Well, you can't have science when you don't know very much. And uh, we don't know very much about this virus. We're still learning all the time. So it's almost inevitable that errors will be made. But the characteristics of a, of a good uh, uh, system and a good public health response is you act early, you go in hard as possible with your action to try and uh, eradicate whatever virus it is or whatever bug it is uh, that's causing the problem. And uh, you don't hesitate and, and, and you don't have any regrets and you just act and do the right thing to protect people's health. Now, this government didn't do that. They said, oh, it wasn't yet time to do such and such. And that was repeatedly their, their uh, story. Whereas I, you know, the time to do it is the time to do it. And that's as soon as you possibly can. And the second thing is even when you get things wrong, there is hope for a system if someone will say, ah, we got that wrong and we're going to change it and we're going to do it differently. And that was a mistake, by the way, and, and we're very sorry, uh, but we are going to do better. Now, I get no sense uh, of anyone being prepared to say that anything was done wrong at all. And, uh, you know, a blind man on a fast horse could tell you that there were serious errors made. Everyone knows that. And then it becomes a sort of an ingrained habit and you get stuck in this uh, very, and it is an ulti the ultimate Westminster bubble that the politicians talk about. You have this very narrowly focused group in London making all these decisions in the assumption that they apply in the same way to everyone. And that's manifestly not true. There, were, uh, there was an opportunity in large bits of Britain and in Northern Ireland to act uh, faster earlier when the, when the disease was still in its early stages and and you know hundreds and thousands of people would still be alive if they'd done that that's my view anyway and i i don't think you get too much argument with it these days what advice would you have to give to uh, northern ireland here gabriel the north Coast? well actually I, in this last few days i've been greatly heartened by some of the things that have happened uh the government, uh, the assembly uh, executive produced a plan the other day on Tuesday, which was actually very good and uh, very sensible. And it talked about the World Health Organization criteria for lifting the lockdown. And, and that's the ones, uh, those are the criteria to use, not the, the tests, the, the five tests that uh, Boris Johnson and his colleagues uh, seem to th think are important. Uh, and it also 
committed to doing what uh, was stopped in early March, which is actually chasing this virus, finding, uh, identifying people with the symptoms who have been infected, um, tracing their contacts, isolating them, the people with the virus and their, their contacts to make sure it can't spread any further, and then starting and doing that again and again and again. So you really, really clamp down on the virus. And we, there is a real problem. There isn't enough testing going on. And what testing is going on is going on in hospitals and care homes and with key workers, but it's not happening in the community. And the experts uh, looking at it say that there are about 20,000 new cases of infection with the virus every day in the UK. And the only way to get a hold of that is to go after it and st actively chase it and actively stop it spreading. And that's what other countries have done. And Ireland has a fantastic opportunity as an island to make use of the island advantage, as I call it, and uh, uh, really cooperate together north and, and south. And there are some things that are good in the north and there are some things that are good in the south. But it's, I think it's absolute madness not to take advantage of that island advantage and uh, cooperate and have a, have, have a joint harmonized approach to dealing with this uh, desperate disease. But I, I, I think there are some grounds for optimism now. I think uh, the politicians in Northern Ireland are, are, are beginning to, to find their own way and look at the best way of dealing it for, with it for Northern Ireland, which is a great thing. Gabriel, you have been appearing on uh, radios and television channels all over the world in the past uh, couple of weeks or so, and you've been asked all sorts of questions. Uh, I wonder, is there any question that you haven't been asked huh. that you think is worthy of being answered? Well, th th there is, Tom. There's one question that uh, I sort of haven't wanted to be asked, and, and, and thankfully no one has asked it until you ask me what's the question i haven't been asked and it's about uh it's a what I, what i don't want to be asked is now once we've got this over are we going to be all right then for 100 years or something and, and the answer to that question is no and the hard truth is that once we have this virus dealt with there could be another one along any time any time and uh there will be a lot of countries that will be better prepared and hopefully we'll deal with it, but we might get an even worse virus that finds some new way to attack us that we haven't come across before. So we could have to start all this over again. It might not happen for 100 years, but it might happen in one year. So there's a lot of hard work to get it, pick ourselves up, dust ourselves down, mourn those that have passed on, rebuild our communities and our economy, and then prepare to make sure we're not caught the same way again in these islands and I think I think that's extraordinarily important to do. Gabriel thank you very much and to err I suppose on the side of caution at all times. Oh yeah the, the, the precautionary principle Tom uh, if you have a chance to prevent something prevent it and don't wait don't hang around just if there's a problem get in front of it and prevent it. A little bit of care takes the edge off bad luck is to say on here ah, that's a good one i'm here at home at the moment gabriel you're at home in bristol i'm in uh Restrever. you're in bristol uh far apart but i suppose i think it was pete seeger said one time i wonder will technology help us to save ourselves before we destroy ourselves with it and uh, i suppose uh, this technology is one of the great ways of uh, proving maybe that technology can better itself. Uh, well, we're heading towards uh, an opening up, if you like, at this stage, it would seem. Uh, how much can we open up? But it's going to take a bit of time. It's going to take uh, some months before things start really relaxing, I think, and uh, we'll not be properly safe until we have an effective vaccination and some decent treatments. And there are plenty of people working away at doing, doing those. And the meantime, you know, we've got things to do. It's most amazing how people are working from home as much as they possibly can. And uh, the, I, I think we'll see uh, a lot of people re-evaluating their lives, especially those who have got long commutes to work and things like that. And they, they, they might think, well, this, you know, in some ways has taught me the value of being with 
at home with my family and maybe I, I, I don't want to hit the road quite as much as I often uh, did to get on the, 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 the train or the bus or whatever it is and, and work out new ways of doing the things that we, we really want to do. So I'm, I'm, as ever, I'm an optimist, even though, you know, there is that old saying, an optimist is someone who hasn't heard the bad news yet. But I think we've had the bad news, so it's time for a bit of optimism. Okay. Gabriel, before you go, would you give us another one? Uh, I, I will tell, this is a, this is a great song. Uh, I think it's a great song. It's a, a contemporary song, and it's by Sean Moan, who's a great songwriter. You know, and uh, this one sums up a lot of my own views, I suppose, and values, anyway. And it's called uh, uh, Lovers and Friends. Lovely. Battles and wars leave deep wounds and scars, and deep wounds are long in the mending. While reflecting upon all that is gone, life rushes on to its ending. The joys and the pain in the memory remain, and by memories lifetimes are measured. But the time that we spend among lovers and friends are the times we remember with pleasure. So fill up your glass, that future and past, in harmony be determined. There is more friendship poured out in one bottle of stout than you'll find in statute or sermon. I've heard all the old songs, all the rights, all the wrongs, all the prophets of doom and destruction, street corner messiahs and moral pariahs, and dealers in bribes and corruption, denials and lies from the holy and wise, while innocent youth was forsaken. But I've seen the night end among lovers and friends, and been sorry to see the dawn breaking. So fill up your glass, that future and past, in harmony be determined. There is more friendship poured out in one bottle of stout than you'd find in statute or sermon.